Good evening, friends. It's a pleasure to be here again tonight in the name of our Lord Jesus to serve him with all of our heart. And it's with great uh, pleasure that we come in this manner to serve him. I'm so thankful to see this uh, nice audience here tonight, on the Monday night. Last night I thought maybe with no seating room would discourage many of the people. As it said, so many were turned away from the outside. But tonight, you're back again, and I'm thankful for you. May God bless you and grant to you the desire of your heart. And I just hope we have the old-fashioned revival that we've been looking for for so long here in Phoenix. God be praised. And now, the meetings are a little, has a little wear to me, as you understand that vision is kind of hard on the human being. It's been through the ages, and it is yet tonight. And it perhaps always will be until we get a glorified body, and we can understand. But being human, it's, we can't understand those things sometimes how the Lord does work in that manner. Now, one night this week, if the Lord willing, I want to speak a gospel message on the God's unconditional covenant. And perhaps maybe tomorrow night, if the Lord will, it's nothing but just to build the faith of the people, just to get them built up to a place where it gets all the scare away from them. And... We're trying our best to do that. The Christian has not one worry in the world. They should be the most freest, happiest people in all the world. Because there's nothing you can't lose. And all things work together for good to them that love God. So how can we lose? There's just nothing to lose, is there? We're just anchored away in Jesus Christ going home to glory, having a good time while we're going along, God providing everything for us, marvelous. Is this little Brother Joe sitting here? Uh, uh, first time I've seen you for years, Brother Joe. You was over at the Spanish church. I remember you. Uh, I, I just wonder what it would be when we get up to glory and look around like that and see a face, you know, that you recognize. What's been my anticipations is thinking after world travel, and seeing so many hungry people in things across the world and so many real devout Christians throughout the entire world, I'm thinking of a time when we'll, when we'll all sit at one big table, all the human race that's redeemed. And just think of that time when we come in there at that great big welcome table and just for a thousand miles, You'll just see just the saints sitting at this table. Look across the table to one another, and them old veterans, you know, battle scarred from the battle. That's the first thing we're going to do when we come into the glory land, is take the wedding supper. Jesus said, I'll eat it with you, you and you in my Father's kingdom. That's the first thing. What a beautiful picture of when Rebecca came to meet Isaac and she met him in the field and was taken into the father's tent and married and how the food was served and so forth, just as it will be this time, the wedding supper when we get home. And I look across the table and see many of the old veterans from around Phoenix and different places. We're just, I have to shed a tear or two, won't we? Just to reach across the table and say, oh, what a wonderful time. Just look down through there at each one reaching their hands across and just with hearts full of love, veterans of the field. Then to see coming in here the king in his glory, come walking in his white robes, coming down along the line, putting his arm around each one, hugging us a little bit up close to him, wiping the tears away from our eyes with his nail-scarred hands. So don't cry. It's all over. We're all here now. Enter into the joys of the Lord, which has been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. That's the day we're looking for. That's what we're striving for. I heard a radio broadcast recently where the majority of the great scientists of the world gives the world ten years before total annihilation. Ten more years. Now, that's just guesswork. But where the hydrogen or oxygen, if they ever start in a battle with that one bursting here and there and here, I don't know what will take place. 
just probably sweep the whole world over, and that'll be it. It won't be even mountain, tree, green thing, or anything left on earth. Just exactly what the Bible said. But we'll be gone at that time. Yes, sir? It's a part of us that's immortal. No atom, no hydrogen, or nothing is needed for that. It's spirit. We'll be caught up in a moment in a twinkling of the eye to meet the Lord in the air. There's three comings of the Lord. You know that. There's three of everything in the Scripture. Three is God's perfect number. Three, seven, twelve, twenty-four, forty, fifty. But three times he came once to redeem his bride. He comes the next time we meet him in the air to receive his bride. He comes the next time in the millennium with his bride. That's after the wedding supper is over, we return back for the millennium. I want to see him, don't you? Here's some time ago. I was heard an old man speaking and he's talking about an old slave. I don't know whether I told you about it or not. That he got salvation. The Lord saved him and they freed him. And when he was dying, he said he had entered into the gates and said he was standing just behind the door. And someone come over and said, Sam, come and receive your crown now and your reward. And he said, crown? Reward? He said, don't talk those things to me. Just let me stand and look at him for a thousand years. That's all I want to do. That's the way we feel. Don't you think that's not the feeling of all Christians? I don't want no crown. I don't want no reward. I just want to see him. I just want to look at him. Just to stand and look at him. That would be enough for me. If he condemns me at the end of the road and says I must turn the other way, if there is such a thing as love being in hell, I'll still love him. And he's still righteous. I was nothing when I come here. I'm nothing when I leave. If I ever be... Except in there, it will be His grace alone that did it. And that's why tonight that I am striving with all my heart, with love for everybody, everywhere. You might disagree with me scripturally. I don't have too much doctrine inside scripture. I just love the Lord. That's all. See, that's all. And so you might say, well, Brother Branham, I, I believe this. Or maybe I wouldn't. Exactly, see, that wouldn't keep me from having thinking just the same of you. See, we just love one another just the same. And the 23rd chapter of Exodus, the 20th verse, we start reading tonight for just a little, oh, just a few words of that clock moves a little farther around and we can get the feel of the meeting. There is such a thing as you feel the meeting. I would just notice in the best of my memory, when they tell me, and when the anointing of the angel of the Lord comes, it, it, well, I just don't remember it no more. What takes place, lest they tell me, now it seemed like I dreamed it. The best I remember, there's some cots and things laying here last night. They're not here tonight. I hope that there's no wheelchairs tomorrow night. The people will be out on the streets walking around normally and well. You can. If you just believe, Jesus wants to do that. He wants to free every one of you. Daddy wants to bring you out of that chair. He wants to heal this woman coming here, this young lady sitting here just in the prime of life. He don't want you there. He wants you up walking like you used to be. He wants you well. Please believe him. If there's anything that I could do to help you, I'd do it. If there's one thing I could do to help anyone and wouldn't do it, I'd be a brute not to do that. But the reason I'm here trying to represent our Lord is because I believe by His mercy to let me do it, I believe I can help you to see Him and believe Him and be healed. Don't be scared. That's the reason you, you, you can't receive is because you're afraid it won't happen. Just as in your mind it's already happened. See, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, while I believe you have the scripture this time, I want to read a portion here. God commissioning Moses. 
Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way, to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him, and obey his voice, and provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice, and do all that I speak, then I'll be an enemy to thy enemies, an adversary to thy adversaries. For my angel shall go before thee, and to bring thee unto the Amorites, Hatites, Persianites, Canaanites, Habites, Jupitites, and I will cut them off. And thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works. But thou shalt utterly overthrow them, and quite break down their images. And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. And shall we bow our heads while we talk to the author of this word? Our kind, loving Father, it's with a grateful hearts that we approach thee tonight in the name of thy loving child, Jesus knowing this, that he has promised us, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, that will I do. Then we know that if we come in his name, we will receive that what we ask for. For we're coming God's provided way through Jesus Christ. Therefore, with perfect assurance, we believe that we will receive. And now, Lord... We ask Thee to give a special anointing to both speaker and hearer at this time of Thy Word. And may the hearer receive and may open up a way and pull out, as it were, the roots and branches of unbelief. And may the bed of God's seed be sowed right into his heart and may it bring forth great results this very night. Have mercy, Lord. This little audience that you've given me tonight to speak to is a purchase of your blood. And I love them. And I pray that you'll let me help them in some way by speaking to them in thy name. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name, thy Son. Amen. God commissioned in Moses here. Most of you are acquainted with the story. How that God led the children of Israel from down in Egypt up into the promised land. How that through a famine they were taken down in Egypt in the early days. God met Abraham, giving the promise and the covenant and said his seed would sojourn in a strange land, being strangers for 400 years. And then with a mighty hand would he bring them out. What a marvelous thought. And he said then that he had bring them into the land that he had give Abraham and to his seed for a promise, for an inheritance forever. And then we know how that the patriarch sold Joseph, which was a perfect type of Christ. How that he being loved of the father, hated of the brothers. Just a typical, well, it was Christ in Joseph. And... They hated him without a cause because he was spiritual. He was born a seer. And he seen visions, dreamed dreams and interpreted them. He were more spiritual than the rest of his brothers. And they hated him without a cause. They ought to have loved him more because the first, that God was with him. You just do favor for those that God is with. And watch how you prosper. And God is always with his son, Christ Jesus. You know that. So just do him favor and see how you prosper. So instead of that, they hated him, was jealous of him. A very beautiful type of today, the spiritual church, hated of the half-brother for no reason at all. For the art to be in love that we're having a great revival, everyone ought to be loving God for that. But instead, without a cause. And you notice he gave him a coat of many colors. Now, there's only seven perfect colors, and those perfect colors are seven colors in the rainbow. And perhaps was the rainbow 
a type of Christ, which after the resurrection, John saw him sitting to look up on the jasper, starter stone, that's Benjamin and Reuben, first and last, he which was, which is, shall come, the root and all spring of David, the morning star, rose of Sharon, lily of the valley, Alpha Omega. There he sits with the rainbow over his head. A covenant. A rainbow means covenant. God gave the rainbow sign to Noah as a covenant. And he made a covenant with Jesus Christ to the world, and whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have an everlasting life. Now, Joseph had a coat of many colors, perhaps a rainbow. Then was hated of his brethren, was supposedly to be killed and thrown into a ditch by his own, his brothers, as Jesus was killed by his own, thrown into a ditch, but was taken up, Joseph was, and was set at the right hand of Pharaoh, the greatest commercial and military country of the world, and no man could come to Pharaoh except by Joseph. And Jesus is taken up out of the ditch of the grave and set at the right hand of the majesty on high, and no man cometh to the Father except by the Son. Hallelujah. No man can come except by the Son. Watching his temptation when he was in prison, his beards growed out. And there was a but butler and a baker, and they had a dream, and Joseph interpreted the dream. And one of them was lost, and one was saved. Jesus, when he was tacked to the cross in his prison house of death, one thief was lost and the other was saved. Perfect type. How did he give his body as a witness or a sign? He said, now, someday God's going to surely visit you. When he died and he left his bones in an old casket, I was supposed to lay my hand on that casket recently. In a museum that they brought Joseph's bones that laid in Egypt, made out of lead, about that thick, beat out lead. And the famous stone of Scrone looked to me like a piece of Bedford stone to me, just a little thing sitting under an old antique chair. And anyhow, on this going down into Egypt, and Joseph, when he died, he left a memorial, his bones. Letting them know that someday they were going out before those bones perished, that they were going out. I want to stop here just a moment. You know, the scripture is given by inspiration. You, you don't just learn it in schools. It has to come by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. No matter how smart and shrewd you are, the Holy Spirit reveals the Word of God. Look at those Pharisees in the days of Jesus and Sadducees and teachers. Holy man, without blemish. Scholars had to be born in a certain lineage. Levite had to be trained from youth up in the Scriptures to know every meaning, and yet failed to see Jesus and recognize Him. On the whole Scripture is laying full of it, of His coming. Get what I mean? So don't expect to know God by education or theology. You know God by being born again, new birth. The Holy Spirit wrote the Word of God, and He's so entangled it in there, He said, I've hid it from the eyes of the wise and prudent, and will reveal it to babes such as will learn. So if you want to know anything, get to be a baby. Don't be too smart. The way up is down. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. He that exalts himself shall be brought to base. And I think of writing the Scripture, how the Holy Spirit hid those mysteries in there, and all the Bible schools and seminaries will never be able to pull it out. God knows it alone and will reveal it to who He will. Is that right? When I'm away overseas, Miss Branham, God knows how I love her, and she'll write me a letter and she'll say, Dear Bill, I'm sitting here tonight thinking of you, praying for you. The children have just gone to bed. We miss you so much. Now, I'm reading what she's saying, but I'm reading in between the lines, too, because I love her, and she loves me, and it's a love affair. And she writes it, not so much on the line, but I know what's in between the lines. Now, when you become in love with Christ, 
That's the way you read the Bible. It's in between the lines. You get what he's talking about. The real spiritual meaning. For instance, let's take a little instant of it. Now, just come into my mind, then we're speaking on this. When Job, old, and God had prospered in him, and the devil said he, what he was going to do to him, and he did. Took all of his riches, made him a pauper, killed his children, burned up his cattle, broke him out in borrows from his head to his feet, and he set out, could even stay in the house. Perhaps the odor was so bad from his, his boils, and he scraped himself with a piece of crop as he sat on the, the ash heap. And there, sitting there, and his members of his brotherhood of church came to him and turned their backs on him seven days. A lot of consolation in that. St. Job, you've sinned. A lot of people think it's because people are sick that they sin. God does deal with sickness and sin by sickness, but not in every case. In this case, he was correcting, or not correcting, but he was uh, uh, bringing out the qualities of a believer. And there were Job sitting there scraping these boils. And his wife come and said, Job, you look miserable. Why don't you curse God and die? Why, you've prayed, you've done everything, and you sit there scraping those boils. And everybody passed by, laughs at you, you become a laughing stock. God doesn't surely answer prayer no more. It's nothing like that. I can see the old patriarch as he looked up at her and said, Thou speakest like a foolish woman. That's wonderful. Now, he never said she was foolish. said she spoke like somebody was foolish. said, The Lord gave, the Lord taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's it. Determine. And sometimes some of your own household will be the one that will discourage you first when you're claiming God's promise for yourself. But then any man that's deeply sincere, as you, you, or any of you here tonight, would be to come in here for this meeting. Deeply sincere, God's under obligation then to you, if you've made your effort, God's under obligation to make his effort. So down from the east came the little prince, El Ahu. Wish we had time to break that word down. El A El La La God Yahweh. Break it down and show you a representative of God, which really meant Christ. Come down to Job in the deepest of his distress. And he didn't accuse Job of being a secret sinner. He began to tell him not about. He said, now look, Job, we'll break it down so the children would understand it. You considered in the 14th chapter here, you said, of Job there where he's right, said, look at the tree. It falls, wind blows it over, life grows again. He said, a little seed falls out of the flower, and the rains come and have a funeral procession and bury it, and rots in the ground. A little old seed breaks up, and the pulp runs out, and after a while, the seed's gone, the pulp's gone, the flower's gone, the stalk's gone. That's not the end of it. There's a germ of life there that'll live again. Here's some time ago, I was sitting with an old Methodist minister by the name of Spurgeon. We were having some ice cream together in the agriculture hour. Come on, the little 4-H club. Many of you here belong to it. And they had, or perhaps you do, they had uh, uh, got a, a corn, a machine that would put out grains of corn so perfect that you could take a handful out of the sack that was put out by the machine and a handful out of the sack that's grown in the field and mix them together, you could never tell them apart no more. Take them to the laboratory and cut them open. Probably the skin looked that thick under those big glasses. Had the right amount of moisture, the same amount of calcium and, and every ingredient that went in it. The heart was laying in the right place. It would make just as good a corn patties. It would make just as good a corn flakes. Eat just as well as the southern. The only way you could tell them, he said, was bury them. And the one that man made rotted away, and that was the end. But the one that God made had a germ of life in it. It lived again. I said, Brother Spurgeon, you better kind of hold my hand. I might embarrass you. <laughs> well, that'd make any, that'd make a Baptist or Methodist either one shout, wouldn't it? See, when two men may belong to the church, one, both of them look alike and could give one another a blood transfusion, but one has everlasting life, the other has not. Both of them go to church, pay their tithes, both religious, 
but one has life and one has not. You get what I mean? Job had noticed that, that germ coming back. He said, but a man goes to his grave, his sons come, mourn, he perceive it not, and they do honor, he understands it not. He said, oh, if thou would hide me in the grave until our wrath be passed. Elihu, in this way, got to him and said, now, Job, watch. Here it is. said, Job, that flower never sinned. That's the reason it dies and comes back, dies and comes back. But man lays down, he never comes back. But he said, there's coming a just one someday who will be able to stand in the breach, put his hand on a sinful man, a holy God, and breach away, and he'll be the life connection. Then man shall rise. Oh, my. Didn't mean much more to Job then. He didn't need no more encouraging. He was a prophet. The Spirit of God come on the prophet. He rose from his ash heap, shook himself. The lightnings began to flash, the thunders roar. The prophet got in the Spirit. He said, I know my Redeemer liveth. And at the last day he'll stand up on the earth. Though the skin worms destroys this body, yet in my flesh I'll see God, whom I shall see for myself. Mine eyes shall behold and not another. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we take nothing out. The Lord gave, the Lord taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What are we discouraged about? I'll see him at the last day, yet just as full of laurels as he could be. Yet in my flesh I'll see him. Amen. Oh, my. Look at him. Then Job. Well, have to hurry. Job, when he died, he specified his burying place. Now, watch between the lines here now. He specified his burying place there in Palestine. Along come Abraham, and when Sarah died, his sweetheart. Heaven wouldn't hardly be heaven without Sarah and Abraham, would it? Them sweethearts of the Bible, see how loyal and loving. Notice, when Sarah died, Abraham bought a parcel of ground near the grave where Job was buried. I wonder why. They said, oh, we'll give it to you. He said, no, I'm going to give you so many shelkies of silver for it, and I'm going to give a witness here to this day to let you know that I have bought this for my burying place. I wonder why. He's a prophet. He buried Sarah. And then when Abraham died, he was buried with Sarah. Is that right? And Abraham begot Isaac. When Isaac died, he was brought and buried with Abraham. Is that right? Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob died down in Egypt. But before he died, being a prophet and knowing that his son was a prophet, and the angel of the Lord touched his hip one night on one side of the river, he was a great, strong, mighty, running man of the world. On the other side of the river, he was a limping prince. I'd rather be a limping prince, wouldn't you? God touched his hip, the meat clave to the bone, and he limped all of his days as he walked. He said, Joseph, before I die, take your hand and lay it on this limping hip of mine. Swear by the God of our fathers that you'll not bury my bones down here in Egypt. I wonder why. <laughs> it's not written in the Scripture. That's between the lines. All right. Joseph did. And when he died, he took him up and buried him in Palestine with his father, Isaac, Abraham. When Joseph died, he said, Don't bury my bones in Egypt. Wonder why. But when you go out, bury my bones in Palestine up there with my fathers. Wonder why. They were prophets. They've seen all the top of things. They know that Job said that at the last day the Redeemer would stand on the earth. They're looking for the coming Messiah. And they know there was not going to be any resurrection down in Egypt. The resurrection was going to be in Palestine. And on the 27th chapter of St. Matthew, the Bible tells us when Jesus rose from the grave that many of the saints that slept in the dust of the earth 
rose with him and come out of the grave and entered into the city and appeared to many of them. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job. Why, I can just see after his resurrection, seeing them appear in the land and speaking and knowing and they went in. That's the reason I say today, friends, I'm called a holy roller too. That's right. I'm glad. I count that a grand privilege. I don't care what you call me. Just bury me in Jesus Christ. For those that are in Christ, God will bring with him in the resurrection. I don't look at it through seminary theology. I look at it through the Spirit of God to see the resurrection. It's only those that are in Christ Jesus will God bring with him. And how do we get in Christ Jesus? Not by joining the church, not by shaking hands, not by packing a letter, but by one Spirit. Are we all baptized into one body? 1 Corinthians 12. Then become members of that body. Amen. How wonderful. There he is. Seen. On years past, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, and then when Moses, the children of Israel, left Egypt, Moses took the body of Joseph and buried them. Think of the beaten backs of those poor old Hebrews passed by, also tormented by the Egyptian persecutors. But every time they look over in that little old lead casket there and see the bones of Joseph, they'll say, Some glorious day we're going out of here. For the prophet has promised us that those bones, before they are deteriorated, will go to Palestine and we'll go home. What a perfect type Joseph was there of Jesus. Here some time ago, Billy and I was going to his mother's grave. She died when he was just 18 months old. We was putting a little flower on Easter morning on the grave and the little fellow was crying. I put my arm around him. I said, don't cry, honey. I said, down here, mother's not here. Neither is your little sister. But their body, their bones lay there. But across the sea, there's an empty tomb. And in him who rose from the grave, the grave knows no death or no sting. They were in him in some glorious day. We're coming out of here, going home. Perfect type. Notice. Then when God's word, after being down there for 400 years, the time of the fulfilling of God's word, he'll keep his word. And when the time of the promise drew nigh, there raised up a Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph and began to persecute the children of Israel. God came down in a pillar of fire, called a man who was called, and run from him, the pillar of fire, which was the angel of the covenant. We all know that. Any Bible reader knows that that was the Logos, which was Christ. The Bible said Moses esteemed the riches of Christ greater than all the treasures of Egypt and forsook Egypt when he had a foot on the throne. But he had rather suffer with the people of God than to have the pleasures of sin for a season. Notice... All great people, great man, and every individual has a time where there is a decision time. You've got to say yes or no. That may be to many in here tonight. You've got to say, I will take Christ for my healer, or I won't. Notice, we'll hurry quickly because have got about 12 minutes. Think of it now. The time of the promise drew nigh, and God called Moses by a pillar of fire in the burning bush. Then God commissioned him. Now, I, behold, I send the angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which has been prepared, which is given to him. Beware of him. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if thou will indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I'll be an adversary to thy adversaries. Notice, he said, I'm going to send him now, and I'll give you already. Here it is. Get it. 
I have given you Palestine. It's yours now. Now it's all fenced in with Habites, Judites, Persites, Amorites. It's all fenced in, but I've given it to you. It's yours. Now let's break that down just for a moment. Now the land belonged to him. Now God didn't say, I'm going to go in there and empty up the land. And then put you in it. He said, I'll give it to you. Now you go fight it out with them. There you are. God's give you healing tonight, lady. You, every one of you. He's give you healing. It's your possession. It's all bound down with Amorites and Canaanites and everything else of unbelief. But go in. Take it over. It's yours. It belongs to you. That's right. I must fight if I should reign and increase my courage, Lord. This is not a picnic ground. This is a battlefield. Amen. See? Not a place where we lay back and say, Now, Lord, you just come push it right in me and then I'll do it. No, no. You don't do it that way. God never did it that way. He has a basis. Like I spoke last night, like the law of electricity, the law of water, the law of gravitation. Everything you have to work accordingly. Now, he said, There's the land. And yet, some of the Israelites, when they looked at it, they said, Well, we can't take it. Why, we look like grasshoppers upside of them big people. One of the spies came back. But there was Joshua and Caleb. They knew what God had said. They said, we can take it. It's ours. Why, Jericho was so big that they could run two chariots around it, a horse race. How can we go in there with our spears and so forth? The gates are shut up. Great men in there look like giants, the Canaanites. Probably the descents of Ham. And how could we ever go in and take that? See, they looked at the natural part. How could this woman walk? How could that one? How could this man ever get out of it? How could that man with a fixing to be dying in the next few days of heart trouble? How can he be made well right now? It's unreasonable. You can't reason it out. God isn't known by reasons. No man understands it. You've got to accept it by faith and say it's so. It's against science, it's against knowledge. The knowledge of this world is foolishness before God. It's against all scientific research for a virgin to bring forth a child, but she did it. Where'd the world come from? God just spoke and said, let there be, and it was. Now, he's given you this promise. It's yours, every one of you. Was healed 1,900 years ago when Jesus died at Calvary? I know he's a whole lot of briars growed up in it. There's a whole lot of Canaanites standing there saying, days of miracles is past. There's a whole lot of Persianites saying... I don't believe in them holy rollers, but go in and take it. It's yours. God give it to you. It's a promise. Go on, take it anyhow. If God said so, what do you care about Canaanites? Those long-faced people who says the days of miracles is past. It is for them, but it isn't for the believer. The fellow said, I don't believe it, Brother Branham. I said, it wasn't for you. It's only for believers. It's all. Not for unbelievers. Now, he said, go take it. Notice, he said, I'll send my fear before you, my angel. He'll prepare the way. And if you notice, when they got over there, one was looking at the material thing. The other was looking at the spiritual thing, the promise of God. Not long ago, oh, five or six years ago, I was called to a hospital where a boy with black diphtheria was dying. The doctor wouldn't let me go in on account of my boy, my little girl. He said, Preacher, you can't go in there. I learned the man was Catholic a little later on. He said, You can't go in there. He said, You got children of your own. The man was trying to be sincere. He said, The boy's dying. There's nothing you can do for him. He said, He's been unconscious now for two days. The cartogram, every water electric cartogram showed the drum down to the almost zero, and said, it'll never come back. The boy's dying. The old father and mother stood there and said, we want him to go anyhow. Well, I said, look, sir, if a priest was standing here and wanted to give that boy the last rites of the church, would you let him go? He said, certainly, but the priest is not a married man with children like you've got. I said, I'll take the responsibility. Well, he tucked me in there and dressed me up like a Ku Klux Klan and all the thing all over me and uh, like that and washed my hands and sent me in 
before the boy, and he was unconscious. The mother bowed on one side, and the father on the other side. The little nurse stood at the end. I had never done a thing but just ask God to let the boy live. Don't believe it's God's will to take that little fellow like that. He's about 15 years old. Laid hands over on him and said, God, this is your word. And I believe you. And I lay my hands up on him in commemoration of what you said. Got up said, Amen. The father ran around on the other side, grabbed the mother, kissed her, said, Mother, isn't this wonderful? The boy laying there dying. Well, he said, Mother said, Oh, it's so wonderful, honey. He said, Think that the Lord has healed our boy. And him laying there dying. The little nurse said, I believe, sir, that you misunderstood what the doctor said. Said, oh, it's good to have faith, but how can you act like that? Be so happy when your boy will be a corpse in the next, next couple hours. Said, that cardiogram, when he goes down that electric, never what it is, it never has been known in all the world's history to ever come up again. Said, the boy's dying. That old saint wiped the tears from his eyes, put his hands over on that little nurse's shoulder, said, my dear loving child. <laughs> he said, you are looking to that electric cardiogram because that's all you know to look to. But I'm looking to a divine promise that was made by God. My boy lives. Hallelujah. The boy's married now and got a baby. <laughs> All right. It depends on what you think about God's promise. He give it to you if you'll go in and possess it. It's yours. Go take it. They said, well, we can't. But Joshua and Caleb know what God had said. So they believed it. Now notice, in the 29th verse, he said, I will not drive them all out in one year unless the beasts of the field multiply against you and come against you. But little by little will I drive them out just as you're able to possess the land. I'll drive them out. There you are. Accept it now. No matter how you feel, don't wait till prayer starts. Accept it now. If you can't move your foot, but you find out you can move your toe, that's all you need right now. <laughs> that's right. Little by little, I'll drive every enemy away, every unbelief ever. Before the meeting's over, you can be shouting and running up down the floor. Just as you're able to accept it, that's how I'll drive it out. I'll send my angel before thee to keep thee in the way. That great, oh, I tell you, the thing Christians don't realize the privilege that we have. We're like going down here to a big arcade and going into a great big uh, a variety store. And you go into the variety store and you look over here, there's some here, you like that. Uh, when I get into the variety store, I like to look around a little, don't you all? Especially if it was mine. <laughs> now I see something up high, I'll get me a ladder and go climb up and look at it. Investigate it, see what it looks like. That's the way it is in Christ Jesus. By one spirit, we're all baptized into God's big variety store. <laughs> Jesus Christ, where we have peace, joy, happiness, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, Holy Ghost, powers of God, speaking with tongues, interpretation of tongues, divine healing, glory, shouts, wisdom, hallelujah. All these things are ours. Every believer belongs to you. I'm the Lord who forgiveth all thine iniquity, who healeth all thy diseases. It's all mine. The divine healing looks a little high up. It's in my variety store because it's right here. And this is our variety store. Amen. Then, when I'm in there, I'll climb up and take this. It's mine. May have to reach a little high. May have to strain a little, but I'll get it. Belongs to me. I'm determined to have it. That's the way the Israelites was. They went right on in there to them big fence walls. Witnesses. Joshua seen God open up the river. It was easier for him to believe the people went shouting the walls would fall. Well, you people who's received the baptism of the Holy Ghost has got a witness that Jesus Christ lives and reigns or it could be an easy thing for you to believe in divine healing. Well, Joshua, you know, just as soon as they started shouting the walls would go to drop, <laughs> the victory was his because God said so. That's it. Said so. The angel of the Lord was going before him. A pillar of fire by night. A cloud by day. The angel of the covenant, the Christ, the Logos, before it was made flesh to dwell among us. Now I want to ask you something. That was the sign of the Old Testament. They followed that pillar of fire. Wherever it went, they went. When it stopped, they stopped. 
And they built their tents under the pillar of fire. A pillar of fire. And then it didn't set a thunderhead of fire now. It was a pillar of fire. And where it stopped, they stopped. And then priests watched it. And whenever it moved, they sounded the trumpets. If it was midnight, 3 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock noon, they all packed and away they went. They followed the pillar of fire. They kept in the will of the Lord by doing so. How beautiful if they ever lost that pillar of fire in the New Testament. I mean in our age. Through 1,500 years of dark ages, they failed to see it. But there was a fellow one day by the name of Martin Luther. He saw the pillar of fire. And away he went on the first Reformation. But you know what? He organized his church so tight, he began to be, it was only the Lutheran church. He was either Lutheran or he wasn't in it. Pillar of fire won't hang over nothing like that. So away it went. Luther couldn't follow it because he had all... Luther had been dead for years. Another round of the servants or apostles of the church and another round, another round, weakened down just like the disciples. And the pillar of fire moved away from the Lutheran church. Luther couldn't go because he had all these rituals and everything wrote up. Then there's a little fellow by the name of John Wesley in England saw it. And away he went. And he had a revival that saved England and the United States and the, the English known world in that day. The Wesley Revival. Wesley, George Whitfield, or oh, Asbury, and many of them. They had that great revival. And then the first thing you know, they got it so organized down that they began to get after a few rounds, just as cold and starchy as they could be. That's right. Pillar of fire won't hang over that. So away it went. And a bunch of people called Pentecostal seen it. And away it went after it. <laughs> and they built them a church under it. But you know, the sad part, the Pentecostals are so organized, the pillar of fire is moving out again, and they can't go. <laughs> That's right. But the pillar of fire is moving anyhow. God said it would. That's right. They had the sign of the fire by night, the cloud by day that led them. Now tonight, here in God's house, or that same pillar of fire is here in the house. Right here now. Because it was the angel of the covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he died, he rose again, and he lives forevermore. He promised the things that he did, but we also are greater for he went to the Father. Is that right? He never claimed to be a healer. He said, I do just as I see the Father doing. That's what I do also. Is that correct? We had it last night and studying it. St. John 5, 19. I do nothing of myself. When they probably criticized him about not healing all those down there at the pool of Bethesda, they just heal one man on a pallet. God showed him where the man was. He went and done what God told him to do and went on. See? And he said, I can do nothing in myself but what I see the Father doing, that I do also. The Father worketh and I work at the other two. All right. Now, that was the pillar of fire made manifest here on earth, following the will of God. Now, tonight, after 1900 years, we have that same pillar of fire. In our midst. You bought a picture of it a while ago. I say it with reverence. Scientifically proven. If I would die this very night. Now that pillar of fire has nothing to do with me. I'm just a man. That pillar of fire is in the church. Not only with me. It's with every one of you. It's all of us. That was just a divine vindication. You know the story. The Baptist minister challenged me on divine healing. And come over there and said that I wasn't nothing but a religious proselyte and ought to be run out of the city and he ought to be the man to do it. Many of you probably was there. How many is at the Houston meeting? Let's see your hands. Sure, they're all around. Well, they put a big piece of paper. Brother, I wouldn't fuss with no one, but Brother Bosworth said, let me have it. And I thought of old Caleb when I saw him. That old man stand there, 70-something years old, to test his wits against a new scholar just out of the cemetery or seminary. Same thing. <laughs> so then, he standing there with this young doctor of divinity, Brother Bosworth said, that's all right, Brother Branham. I won't argue. That night you all know how cool the old patriarch sat there before those thousands and thousands of people. He said, Brother Best, I'll just ask you one question. If you'll answer me yes or no, we'll just walk. We'll settle it. He said, was the redemptive names of Jehovah applied to Jesus, yes or no? I settled it. He said, I'll answer that when I get up. He said, I ask you to answer me now. And you won't have to get up. 
<laughs> That's right. Well, there wasn't nothing to be said. He said, I'm sorry, Brother Beth, that you can't answer that. And I got 600 questions here in the New Testament claiming that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that's one of my weakest. <laughs> and he proved it to be his weakest. But if he said no, then he wasn't Jehovah Jireh, the Lord's provided sacrifice. He wasn't Jesus Christ. And if he was Jehovah Jireh, he had to apply the other redemptive names. Then he was Jehovah Rapha, the healer, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That settled it. So that was all. And that night, when this Mr. Beth got up and slapped that preacher standing there, then he, he said, bring forth that divine healer. Let me see him perform. I'll believe it. Let me see it. Brother Biles was shamed him for it. So then he knew I was up there in balcony 30. And he said, I, no one knew it because the wife was sitting up there and some police, I believe, my brother didn't take me up. And I sat in there and my coat pulled up. And, they, and my brother, Brother Bosworth said, I know Brother Bram's in the meeting. If he wants to come down and dismiss the crowd, all right. If he doesn't, well, that's up to him. And my brother Howard said, you sit still. I said, well, ain't I sitting still? So it was just then I heard something go. <laughs> Here he was. I just couldn't sit still. I raised up. And my wife told him, said, don't. And the people started crying in a big line of ushers, several hundred put their hands together. I come to the platform, I said, just to dismiss the audience, I said, uh, <laughs> Mr. Best, don't think hard of him. He's got as much right in America as being American to believe what he has. He has a scripture right to believe it. But he has as much right as being an American to believe it as uh, not believe it as I have to believe it. That's why we're fighting in Korea now and so forth. I said, I have never one time said I was a divine healer. I said, that same old devil that met Jesus Christ the first time, said, If thou be the Son of God, do a miracle here before me and let me see you do it. A man challenged me on the radio here not long ago. Said he'd give a thousand dollars for anybody that would prove one case of divine healing. About an hour after that, there's about 20 cases standing at my door with doctors and statements and everything else. Let's go collect that thousand dollars. I went over to his house. He said, I'll take you over to Abilene, Texas, our headquarters, and we'll take a little girl over there and we'll cut her arm, and you heal it, and we'll hold it out and let you, we, all of our brethren will give you $1,000. I said, you're suffering with a bad case of mental deficiency. <laughs> Any man would think of such a thing as that. I said, the same old devil that met Jesus and said, now if you be the Son of God, perform a miracle here before me and let me see you do it, and I'll believe you. Turn these stones into bread now and you eat. Now let me see you do it. Tuck him up on the temple and said, Now, if you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, because it's written in the Scripture, give his angel charge concerning this end time of the dash, foot against stone, bear thee up. Quoting Scripture to him, the same old devil said to Jesus on the cross, Now, if thou be the Son of God, pull your hands loose and come down, we'll believe you. Tied a rag around his face and hit him on the head with a reed. Said, You know what people were doing, you're prophets, you understand all things. Tell us who hits you. That same old devil still lives. It's the same thing. Won't the miracle perform this way? Just hasn't got intelligence enough to look around and see what God is doing. Or I would say this, with the right spiritual attitude to see what God is doing. Now, Jesus said, let them alone. If the blind leads the blind, won't they both fall in the ditch? So don't boo poo with them. I said to Brother Bosworth, you oughtn't to do it. I said, I have never claimed to be a divine healer. My literature is published in 17 different languages at that time. And I said, I have never one time made any statement about being the divine healer. I've always said God is a healer. I only point people to Jesus Christ. I said, now, as far as vision being concerned, that's true. That's a divine gift. I said, anyone knows that if God would never have nothing to do with an error. God will never testify of a lie. You know that. And I said, if it's truth, God will testify the truth. If it's not truth, God will never testify of it. I no more than said that to here he come. And they took the picture of it. And then they went home that night, a Jew and a Catholic, the Douglas Studios, and they developed the pictures. And they, they'd hard him come over there, and he took his fist and put it under that old saintly, godly Brother Bosworth's nose and said, Take my picture like this. I don't want to put it in my magazine, skinning this old man. I'm going to take his hide and pack it on my, my study door for memorial to divine healing. A Baptist minister. Now, all Baptists are not like that. So then... He could tug a finger like this, and he got six glosses of him like that. And when they developed the pictures and pulled them out, God wouldn't permit that camera to take one of the pictures. Every one of them was negative. Then when he pulled the other one out, there was the angel of the Lord. 
They sent got George J. Lacey, which is the head of the FBI and fingerprint and so forth, kept it several days in there and studied it and studied everything and come back, called us in the uh, shell building there and for the that evening said, Whose name's Reverend Branham? I said, Mine. He said, Stand up. He said, You'll pass away like all mortals, but said, As long as there's a Christian civilization, your picture will never die. He said, It's absolutely said the old hypocrite always said that there couldn't be scientific proof of an immortal being, but said they can't say it no more. Here is the mechanical eye of that camera won't take psychology. That it's a real supernatural being. And there it was. And there it is tonight. What is it? Not because of me, but because the truth that I was standing for was there. Now, that has been seen in the meetings all over the world. It was seen on the river there when I was just a boy, baptizing my first group in the Baptist church. 500 one afternoon at the foot of Spring Street in Jeffersonville. The newspapers packed an article. A mystic light appears over local Baptist minister while baptizing at the river. It's been many places. You've seen it in the other book where they caught it one night. It's down over the head. Now, that isn't because it's me. That's because of Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. The same pillar of fire that followed the children of Israel is following the Holy Ghost Church tonight. Moses was just one of the prophets among the children of Israel. He wasn't the children of Israel. He's just one of them. See, the pillar of fire never just followed Moses, although he said, I'll send my angel before thee to keep in a way. But it wasn't just for Moses only. It was for all of Israel. We all have to work together as one unit. We have to get our differences the way our lay aside our doctrines and things and put our arms together and press forward and take the promise that God Almighty has given us. May he bless you is my prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee tonight. I have broken up, tried to... To speak a few words here to the people and taking up much of their time. They're such a lovely audience. Now, Almighty God, that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, who's sitting on the throne of God tonight, expecting the church to missionary the world so he can come back and sit on David's throne, his own throne, which he rightly is heir to, grant it, Lord, that his presence. The great Logos, the angel of God that was in the wilderness with the children of Israel, as he re- led them naturally and that day and fed them manna from heaven, so is he leading the church today, feeding us with Holy Spirit manna from heaven, power, signs, and wonders. We thank thee for him, and we pray now that you will send him to your unprofitable servant. And may this be a night that we'll long remember. And when we leave the building going to our different homes, may we say as those who came from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us because of his presence, for we ask it in his name. Amen. I tried to get out at 9.30 each night, but I, yeah, this is new to me. And the meetings is not as forceful as it is because I start speaking and I start preaching. And I'm, it's a different anointing. But we'll... No manager, so we just suffered along for a little while. God be with you. Now, what was the card you gave out? One to a hundred? He gave out this afternoon and tonight a hundred cards, I think, and the letter M. All right. Anybody wants a card, either come in the afternoon or the evening, early, he comes down and gets the cards and gives them out to the people and... And then just when he runs out, he's here, but he runs out and he hasn't got any cards. And Brother Sherrod comes along, picks me up, brings me over here to the meeting at night. And then we just start in there and call so many to the platform, as many as we can get up here and then, and then pray for them. Now, the main thing is, friends, if Jesus raised from the dead, I had a marvelous vision this morning. It's come on my mind three or four times to tell it. And I will wait till some later. I was waking up. My wife is sitting present here somewhere now. And she had went out of the room. And while she was gone, I was looking up towards a square of light. There a powerful vision moved on. When she returned to the room, I told her, and we just shook her the, the power of the Holy Spirit. I re- gave it to a few brethren today that I don't even know what the meaning of it was, but it was certainly glorious. So maybe I'll have time some later on tomorrow night or sometime to speak. What was it? Yeah. Let's 
I believe we called the first of them last night. Did we call from 1 to 15 last night? Wasn't that it? Was that where we called from? 1 to 15. Let's take the last part of them then tonight. That would be 85 to 100. Who has M85? Raise up your 85. All right, come here, lady. And line up a 86. Who has prayer card M86? 86, raise up your hand. 86. All right, sir, right here. Who has prayer card M87? Raise up your hand. Prayer card 87. All right, lady, right here. 88. Who ha- 88. 89. Who has 89? Raise up your hand. Prayer card 89. M89. Would you look at your one of those cards that maybe somebody deaf and can't hear in there? Or check these people in the wheelchairs here, too. 89. M89. Would you raise your hand ever who's here with prayer card M89? Some Spanish people or Indian look at their one another's cards that can speak English or can in, translate and look and see they might not understand me. Now, somebody that can translate it because it's probably, they it's wrote in English, M89. M89, is it appeared? All right. M89. Now, remember, a lot of times when I call them, they say, nobody told me my, my prayer card was called, but nobody told me I was deaf or I couldn't get up and I couldn't move and, and nobody helped me. So I don't remember. I called it 8990. Who has prayer card M90? 91. 92. Raise up your hands. 92. 93. Raise up your hand. 94. 95. 96. That's it. 97. 98. 99. A hundred. Now, while they're getting lined up, I wish the organist would come to the organ, if she would, the musicians. Now, how many in here that does not have a prayer card and wants to be healed, raise your hand. If you notice in every meeting, there's ten healed out there to one at the platform. The only thing I ask you to do is pray and believe with all your heart that the things that I'm telling you is the truth, that God has, has did this, and I believe that with all my heart that each of you will be healed. May the Lord God bless you and grant. Now, I'm going to ask each one, if you will, especially the little ones, be just as, keep your seats just as quietly as you can, because this is the service of the Lord. All right, would you give us a little card, if you would? How, Christians, I'm sure you'll understand. I'm your brother. And in these meetings, you're laboring against everything. Here you are standing on the platform in a bank of spirit. When you break into a a channel of spirit or a vision, everybody praying, some doubting, some this way and some that way. You just don't realize Jesus one day hit a crowd like that and he just took a man by his hand and led him outside the city. And spit in the ground, made mud and put it on his eyes and told him to go wash and the next day he comes see him, see. He went into a place where he's all screaming on account of the little girl had just died, laughing at him because he said she wasn't dead. And he put him everyone out of the house. Went in, see. You've got to have unity, harmony, Everything in one accord. Then the Holy Spirit, you never have to have but one prayer here at the platform. Everything would take place. Yes, that would end it. I trust that you believe I'd tell the truth. God knows I'd tell the truth. I've seen meetings where there'd be piles several deep with wheelchairs and cots and stretchers. And just stand at the platform. In Africa, making one prayer, one afternoon, one prayer, 25,000 people were healed. One prayer. When they seen something happen on the platform, that settled it. He said, if God is up there, God's out here. Well, they couldn't even haul the crutches and cots and stretchers and, and devices as they had or weighing off. They had trucks out there pull them off the ground where they just left them and things like that. The piles. 25,000 healings, one prayer. Now... 
as they're getting the people lined up to come, I want each one of you to be real prayerful. I want you to believe with all your heart now. Believe that God is going to make you well. God will do it. I hope we have this faith all the time. I've seen a lady heal just then. That's right, out in the audience. May the Lord Jesus bless us now. And I want you to be just as reverent as I, I say, just as reverent, and believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is sure to make well all those who are needy. Just what He could do. Now, at the day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, the Almighty who is present, that angel that you see on that picture isn't standing two feet from where I am right now. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I take every spirit in here under my control for the glory of God. Be reverent. Now I must talk to the woman just a moment. Be all of the strangers here in the gates. If Jesus was here, what would he say to the woman? Would he say, I'll heal you? He couldn't, or he's already done it. But he talked to a woman at the well one time about a subject, and he caught what was wrong with her and told her. And if he could only do what the Father would show him. Is that right? That's what the scripture says. Now, as he was here today, he said, he's not dead, he's a living. And he is here. But he's in a spirit form. And this is him you see in the picture there. It's he, the Lord, the Logos, the angel of the covenant. And he's standing present. Now, I will speak to our sister just a moment. I believe you're a stranger to me, are you, lady? We're perfect strangers. Don't know one another. I just want your attention, not that I, for no other purpose, but just like our master called the woman at the well and said, "Uh, bring me a drink. She said, the well's deep. You have nothing to draw with. He said, but if you know who you were speaking to, you'd ask me for a drink and I'd bring you water you didn't come here to draw. You're acquainted with the story, I suppose. wonder why he was doing that. Now, to my honest opinion, after being acquainted with the Spirit, He was contacting her spirit, her soul. Find out what was wrong. Now, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and I speak to you, and if that pillar of fire is here, and us being strangers and know one another not, and I know nothing about you, you know that. Well then, if the Holy Spirit will come and tell me what your trouble is, or something in that manner. Like Philip, when Philip come to him, he said... uh, Went and got Nathaniel, and he said, could anything good come out of Nazareth? He said, come and see. And he said, when he saw Philip coming, he said, there's an Israelite in whom there's no guile. He said, when did you know me? He said, before Philip called you when you were under the tree, I saw you. That settled it. Didn't it? Just when he said that, that was enough. That would be enough for you tonight, would it? To make you believe. Well, I trust that he will. And just the same thing, a man talking to a woman. Like it was at the well. That's the way it starts again tonight. A man talking to a woman. And the woman was a believer. She said, our father Jacob dug this well and so forth. His cattle drank from it. And you're a believer. And I'm your brother. And now, God Almighty will have to reveal, if he will, your trouble. It's not exactly a trouble. You do have trouble with your eyes. You had that for some time. That's astigmatism, of course. But you're trying to represent somebody from another country 
It's in a country where there is a, it's a great rolling country, a lot of lakes in it. It's Minnesota. Is that right? And it's, they've got a real rare disease. And I see the doctor, a tall, thin man, waiting on her. Is that true? And she has something like the blood ain't going through the arteries or something. I see him with something in his ears touching it like that and shaking his head. Isn't that true? Was those things true? Now, that wasn't me talking. That was someone else. Is it the truth? That if he knows what is wrong, he knows what, if he knows what has been, he knows what will be. Is that right? I believe it was for a friend. Was that right? Give me your handkerchief and come here. Dear Heavenly Father, for one who is laying, which is dear, I pray that you will heal with your mighty power. May the Holy Spirit of God go forward now. And may the person be healed and this woman healed. For the glory of God, in Jesus Christ's name, I ask that. Amen. God bless you, sister. God bless you. How many believes with all your heart? Now, everyone in here ought to say right now, I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is present. He rose from the dead. He's not dead. He's living. And he's living here tonight in you. See? It's only a vindication of his presence. He just does this to stimulate your faith. He preaches the Word. Then He comes and makes manifest the Word. He's declaring miracle. Whatever the person was and whoever they was, I know not. Frankly, right now, I couldn't tell you what the person was wrong or ever who's passed through. That's absolutely the Spirit of God and the supernatural. Now, come. Of course, anyone can see the man's got a trumpet in his ear. Let's bow our heads a moment till we get... And don't raise your head till I ask you. Oh, kind Lord, who brought Jesus from the grave. As David said, the Lord said unto my Lord, Set thou on my right hand till all the enemies be made to footstool. I pray thee, Father, to be merciful to this man. Standing here with this big trumpet sticking in his ear, Satan has did this evil so that he could run him before a vehicle somewhere and kill him, send him to a premature grave. That enemy, he's a horrible fellow. But thou art the glorious Son of God who stripped him from all of his powers at Calvary. And Lord, I pray that you'll give us that which you promised to this very night. That you said, whatever you ask in my name, that I'll do. And I ask that this evil, deaf spirit that's binding the man come out of him. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, may it leave him. How long have you been that way? By hearing us have gone and out of here. Um, do you, you believe that the Lord Jesus? Sure, right. All right, you can raise your head. All right? You can hear this sounding. Um, so you believe with all your heart. Sure, I believe with all my heart. And you know he loves you, don't you? Yes, it's yeah. not very plain. Yes, yeah. you hear me. I believe. Now, of course, you got eye trouble. It's bothering you too. Is that right? Yes. It's your eyes. And um, you also have a blood clot in your leg. Is that right? That's right. It's gone Once from you. Years. Yes, sir. It's been there a long time, but it's leaving you now. And another thing, you're fixing to take a trip. An airplane trip. Yes, my yes sir. Your father-in-law just died, and your father-in-law lives in Idaho. That's, right. That's where you come from. And he just died, and you're going in the morning. You got the message today, so go on your road rejoicing and be happy. And the Lord, yes, sir. And the Lord God bless you and me. Just have faith in God. Believe with all your heart, and you shall have. What you asked for.
You believe that arthritis would leave you? You got high blood pressure too, don't you? Yes, high blood pressure and uh, and, and, uh, you got asthma, asthmatic condition. Is that right? All right, raise up your hand and say, I accept it. God bless you. May the Lord Jesus make you well. (laughs) Amen. Have faith. You don't need your prayer card now. Have faith in God. Mm-hmm. Got a hernia, have you, mister? You want to get over that? You believe that God will heal you of that hernia? You do? God bless you. <laughs> May you receive it. What do you think, ladies, sitting there? You believe with all your heart? You do? You want to be made well? Yes, sir, the gall, bladder trouble and things. Is that right? Well, you're healed. God bless you and go home and be made well. I have faith out in the audience here, see? Just the audience, the anointing of the Holy Ghost is everywhere now, see? You just have faith and believe. That's all you need. Have faith in God. Don't doubt. Believe with all your heart. God will bring it to pass. All right, bring the patient. Trying hard, brother. Just keep believing. Come, lady. We strangers to each other, sister. i never seen you in my life. Now to heal you, I could, if you're sick. But your life could not be hid from me now. Because it's not me. It's the kindness of our Heavenly Father by a divine gift. I see a sign marked up that says 9 a.m. It's an operation. That either comes Sunday or Monday one. It's for tumor, is that right? Oh God, who made mercy, grant mercy to our sister and Debbie successfully and may she be well through Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Have faith in God. You're trying to have faith. The lady sitting next to you can be healed by high blood pressure if she wants to be. You want to be healed with your high blood? You believe he healed you? Raise up your hand and say, I accept it. God bless you. Then go home and may it drop in the name of Jesus Christ. And may you be made well. All three of you need your healing. Believe with all your heart and you can go receive it. God bless you. How do you do? I suppose we're strangers. God Almighty, who created the heavens and earth, who His presence I stand in now, knows that your life could not be hid as far as His will would be. He could reveal it. And now, oh my, I just wish that I could get Wish I could explain what I what I mean now. Don't doubt. Your prayer is answered, ladies, saying out the red coat that's got that high blood pressure that God bless you. God be with you. You go home and may the Lord God bless you. You've got a liver trouble, have you sitting right there? You want God to heal you? You believe he will? Alright, accept it. There's an accident. I see a car running through here. It's, it's an accident. Somebody's in an accident. No, oh, they've hurt their hip. Raise up. Accept your healing. God bless you. Be made well. Come. You believe with all your heart? All right. You're here for the little girl. 
And the little girl has, uh, she's anemia, and she has leukemia. The doctors just give her up. You have asthma yourself. You're our nurse. You was in a sick in a hospital. You were healed. And you backslid. God bless you. Give your heart to God and the baby will get well. Won't that you go and God be with you. Have faith. Believe with all your heart. Come. How many believes? Be a wonderful time. You want to deal with that arthritis lady? Go believe in God with all your heart and receive it. Let's say praise the Lord. All right, come, lady. God bless you, lady. Realizing your stomach trouble has turned to cancer. So do you believe now with all your heart he'll heal you? In the name of Jesus, go and be made well. In Jesus Christ's name. All you have to do is to believe. Come, lady. You believe? You ought, would you obey me as God's prophet? You believe it. Stomp your feet and the arthritis will leave you. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. You may be you believe me as God's prophet? Yes, I do. Catch your breath real deep. You're not coughing now. The asthma has left you. Go in the name of Jesus and be made whole. All right. You see, while you're sitting there, lady, just keep moving. Thanking God. Bless you. Let's say praise the Lord. <laughs> believe with all your heart. You shall see the glory. Go shouting and praising God. I believe every person in here can be healed at this time. The whole building's becoming milky. I can't even see what I'm looking at, Harley. You believe, lady? You believe, yeah, all you? Every one of you that believes that Jesus Christ is here in the building now, stand up to your feet and accept Him as your healer, and you shall be made well. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ's name, I cast away every evil spirit, free the sick and the afflicted, and make them well. Amen. Yeah.